Good morning. Good morning. Are you excited to be here? Yes. Me too. So, you are here at the Summer Business Institute, and so that says to me that you have some interest in business. Is that right? Yes. All right, sort of. There's an honest answer. Um, why? Why do you think you're interested in business? Anybody just jump right in here. Yes? You've seen your family go through it. You like finding solutions to problems. Yes, sir. Go ahead, or oh, ma'am, I'm sorry. How to make money, how to manage money. Yeah. Okay, you don't know really what you want to go to college for. This is an interesting way to find out. Yes. A lot of different career paths you can get into, right? Go ahead. Um, you get to communicate with a lot of people. You get to communicate with a lot of people. All those are great answers. And what's impressive to me is that you have answers. See, when I was at your stage in life, I felt like I had no answers. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. What I was really good at was one thing. I was really good at meeting other people's expectations. In particular, I was really good at meeting my parents' expectations. I was one of those kids maybe that you would call a goody two-shoes. I was a middle child. My sister was sort of artistic and creative and rebellious. And my younger brother was athletic and rebellious. And I was this kid in the middle who felt like my job was to meet other people's expectations. My job was to please my parents. My job was to make sure I never let anybody down. And so at your stage in life, I didn't really know what I wanted. I didn't know what my path was. I was just sort of trying to please others. Maybe some of you feel that way. Or maybe you think you know exactly where you want to go. But the purpose of this week, in addition to having you learn a little bit of more about business, to learn about other options for you, it's also for you to learn about yourself and people around you. It's an opportunity for you to start to find your way. When I went off to college, I was scared, actually. I was scared because I didn't really have a clue what I wanted to do or who I wanted to be, and so many people around me seemed to have it all figured out. So many people around me seemed smarter, more together more confident, and I felt, honestly, weighted down by other people's expectations. So off I go to college, and I don't really think about it, but somehow I ended up taking this class that I found really fascinating. It was a philosophy class. Not business, not economics, nothing practical, really. I thought it was philosophy, except I found it fascinating and challenging, and so I kept taking philosophy, and eventually I graduated with a degree in not business, not social science, not political science, not, I, 
graduated with a degree in medieval history and philosophy. Nothing you can do with that, right? Absolutely nothing you can do with that, unless you want to go on and become a professor, which I didn't think I wanted. But all the way through college, my parents had told me, no, 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 what you're going to do is go to law school. My dad was a professor of law. And remember, I was someone who pleased my parents. I met other people's expectations. So I'd worked hard and gotten good grades. And OK, I'm going off to law school. And off I went. Except when I got there, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. My dad loved it. I hated it. And here, this people-pleasing middle child, who'd never struck out on her own at all, was suddenly faced with the fact that every single day for me was a chore. Every single day was terrible. I felt no challenge, no joy. In fact, every day I would get literally a splitting headache, because I hated it so much. It took me a while to figure it out, and then one day, after about two and a half months in law school, I went home and I said to my mother and my father, I'm quitting. We didn't quit in my family. I had never quit. And my parents said the obvious thing, what are you going to do? And my answer was, I don't know. I didn't. But I had to make, um, I had to make money. I had to make a living. So I took a job I knew how to do. I had put myself through school typing. I was a secretary. I was a temporary secretary in college. My college was very expensive, and I needed to work to help my parents pay the bills. And so I answered telephones, and I typed and filed in businesses. I had no interest in business. I just made money typing and filing. We actually had typewriters back when I was in college. Not computers, typewriters. That's what I did. So I went back to work full time typing and filing and answering the phones in a nine person business with no plan. And I had disappointed everyone. And all the people's expectations, my dad thought I was going to be in the law review, they were all dashed along with my decision to quit. I start with that story because it turns out that I didn't start to find my own way or figure out who I was or what I was made of or even what I was capable of until I ditched the plan disappointed other people's expectations, and had to figure it out on my own. And I hope that this week is an opportunity for you to start to figure it out on your own. All of us have loads of people around us who tell us how to be, tell us who to be. Maybe it's our parents. Maybe it's our friends. Maybe it's our posse. Maybe it's our pack. Maybe it's our tribe. But we're all surrounded by loads of people telling us how we should do things. Sometimes it's very direct, like you should go to business school, or you should go to law school, or you should go to this school, or that school. Sometimes it's not so direct. Sometimes it's just, you know, you post a photo on Instagram after you've carefully curated it and made sure it's exactly the image you want everyone to have of you, and then you get some feedback. And that feedback isn't necessarily what you wanted. And then you start to doubt yourself and you say, wow, I, I'm getting criticized for this. Maybe I'm supposed to be another way. You guys are f surrounded by people's expectations. You're surrounded by pressure to fit in. I remember that pressure to fit in, it's real. 
And it's probably in many ways more intense for you than it ever was for me because you have those handy dandy devices. I didn't used to have those. So I would just have to actually talk to people face to face, but you get all that input and all those expectations and all that criticism and all that. Why are you doing that? Every single minute in your phone. The title of my third book, which you're going to get after you leave here, is Find Your Way. It's incredibly important for each of us to find our way. And a lot of the messages that you hear growing up and in college and even when we're adults lead us exactly to the opposite place. We don't find our way. We do what other people think we should do. And the reason it's so important to find your own way is because that's the only way you figure out what you have inside. Here's what I know. I started out as a scared 22-year-old typing and filing in a nine-person office. I had disappointed everyone who knew me. And yet, by starting there, it's the only way. I eventually became a chief executive officer of a $90 billion company in 156 countries. All the times I had to overcome fear, and there were many times, and we'll talk about that, is the only reason that I could ever have the courage to run for president. Here's what I know. Every single one of us has more potential than we realize. Each of you have far more potential than you realize. And the only way that we unlock our own potential, the only way we figure out what we're really made of and what we're really meant to do, and each of us have a purpose, is we have to challenge ourselves. And that means we have to make ourselves uncomfortable and try something new and actually run towards a problem instead of running away from a problem. And to really find our own way and find out what we're made of, we eventually are going to have to say to all the people who are telling us how to be, sorry, I'm not doing that. I'm doing this. I'm going to tell you a story that you're going to hear other times this week from me. Today, we're here face to face. As your week goes on, you'll uh, see me via video. But I'm going to start with a story that you'll hear again from me. When I was 15, I was living in Ghana, West Africa. My dad took us to Ghana. And when we arrived in Ghana, nobody looked like us. It was a completely different country, a completely different culture. We were honestly the only people who were white that I saw for many, many months and many miles. It was an incredibly exciting experience because everything was new and different. But one day when I was uh, with a Ghanaian friend of mine and we were driving along the road and I saw these enormous mounds I mean, uh, some of them were almost as high as this roof of dirt. And I said, what are they? They were everywhere. What are those? And my Ghanaian friend said, those are termite hills. I had these termites who would build these enormous sand castles, kind of literally. And he said the reason that they could build these enormous things is because a termite had a certain life. A termite's life was to get on a path. And every day, the termite would get out of the hill and he would, or she, would go along their path and they would push dirt. And at the end of the day, they would go back. And the next day, they would get up and they would get on that same path and they would push a little more dirt. Next day, they'd go back. For their entire lives, termites stay on their rut, you might say. And I said, wow, 
how interesting, ooh, what a terrible life. And my friend said, you know, people can be a lot like termites. Took me a long time to understand what he meant, but in truth, of course, he was right. Because we can all get kind of in our rut, pushing our dirt, day after day, meeting everyone's expectations, doing all the stuff we gotta do. I mean, we get caught up. We get caught up in all the things that fill our days. And it feels like we're getting a lot done sometimes. But sometimes we're just pushing the same old dirt. Do you know people like that? Do you know people who spend all day, every day, busy, 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 and yet, at the end of the day, when you think about what actually got done or what was the impact really, there's not much to show for it. Or sometimes you'll meet people who, are, who have done something for so long, and there are other opportunities for them to do different things, and yet they don't see them somehow. They miss them because their heads are down and they're moving their dirt. I have met many, many, many people who are so clear at a certain point in their lives about where they're supposed to go. They have a plan, just like I did. I had a plan to go to law school. And they get their heads down and they head towards that plan. I'm gonna be a lawyer, because that's what my parents want me to be. Or I'm gonna do this, because this is what all my friends are doing. Or, you know, at a certain, I'm gonna get married by this point and I'm gonna make this much money by that point, and I'm gonna own my own business. Whatever they think their ambition and their plan are, they become single-minded in pursuit of that. Maybe their plan is to please others. Maybe their plan is to meet other people's expectations. Maybe their plan is to fit in. Maybe their plan is, I just don't wanna get criticized, so let me do what everybody else I know is doing. Whatever their plan is, they get kind of fixed on it and they miss everything that's going on around them. You're at the stage in your life where a lot of people are asking you a lot of questions that make you think, I need a plan. I need to find that rut I'm supposed to be in pushing my dirt. People are asking you, well, where are you going to school? What are you gonna major in? What are you gonna do when you get out? What do you wanna be when you grow up? It's okay not to know the answer to any one of those questions. Because sometimes we can get so fixed on the dirt we're trying to push every single day and the plan we're supposed to be following that we just miss opportunities all around us. I have seen more people derail their future by missing what's right in front of them because their heads are down and they're moving their dirt. So now I'm gonna ask you to think about when you were a lot younger than you are now. At some point when maybe you were two or three or four or five, somebody started to teach you how to cross the street. And what did they say to you? The first time, if you can remember, the first time somebody ever taught you how to cross the street, what did they say? Yes. Uh-huh, look both ways. First they might have said stop, right, stop. And then they said look both ways. And they might have actually said listen, right? Listen if you hear oncoming traffic. Stop, look, listen. That is really good advice in life. That is really good advice Anytime you encounter something new, and you are this week, is to stop, pick up your head, get it out of your phone, look, look around, and listen. It's funny how we learn most about ourselves by sometimes interacting with others. It's funny how we learn so much about ourselves by listening to others and thinking about what they're saying. 
It's funny how much we can learn about ourselves by picking our head up and seeing an opportunity to make a difference, even if it's not on the plan. I told you that I was that secretary, you know? I was that 22-year-old young woman, nope. I'd blown up the plan. I'd blown up the plan. Everybody was disappointed. I had no idea what I was doing. And one day, two men came to me who worked there, and they came up to my desk and they said, we've been watching you. We think you maybe could do more than type our letters and file our correspondence. Do you want to learn about business? And I said, yeah. Now, two things happened. Number one, they introduced me to a world that I hadn't even thought of, because see, that wasn't on the plan. Business wasn't on the plan. I didn't know anyone who was a business person. My mother was an artist, my father taught law. I mean, I just, it was totally outside my experience. And all of a sudden, this was a whole new world that somebody was introducing me to. But the other thing that happened is I felt a certain way when they said, you can do more. They had seen possibilities in me that I didn't know were there. And because they saw possibilities in me, suddenly I saw myself differently. Pick your head up. Don't get too stuck on a plan. Stop, look, and listen and find your way. And I'll tell you something funny. I've learned in life that the way you find your way is to solve a problem that's yours to solve. Not to run away from a problem, to solve a problem. Seems sort of counterintuitive, doesn't it? When I finally um, decided to go off and get an MBA, uh, yes, an MBA, at my you know, finish being a secretary, then to horrify my parents even more, I ran off to Italy to teach English. I mean, I wasn't part of the plan. What was I doing? I was making $10 an hour under the table. I did that. I came back and decided finally, okay, I'm gonna get an MBA. And I landed in a huge corporation, AT&T at the time, one million employees. And I was at the very, very bottom. And back then, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me. They were mostly guys. And honestly, I thought I probably wouldn't make it six months. My prayer at the end of each and every day was, please don't let me get fired. Now, you might think that in such a situation, the way to go would be to play it safe and to do what everybody was telling me to do. And sometimes I did that. But here's the thing. Everywhere I looked, I saw all these problems around. I saw problems that everybody talked about. I saw problems that everybody complained about. I saw problems that everybody gossiped about. And yet, no one did anything about them. They just sat there. Do you have, are you aware of problems in your schools, your communities, your circle of friends, your families? How often do people talk about the problems and not do anything about them? Like most of the time, right? Most of the time, people talk about them. And yet, a lot of things never change because people don't actually say, you know what, I'm gonna fix this problem. This problem is my problem to solve. What I ended up doing was solving problems, little problems at first, and then bigger problems. And the more problems I solved, the more I realized I liked it. I found it challenging, I found it interesting, I loved working with other people to do it. And the more problems I solved, the more confidence I gained. And pretty soon I learned that if you solve problems and change the order of things for the better, not only do other people notice, 
but you build capability. That's why I said sometimes the way we figure out what we're really made of is to actually solve a problem that's in front of us, to make, us, to make ourselves uncomfortable, to challenge ourselves, not to fit in, not to run away from the problem like most people do. I'll tell you another story. This one happened not so long ago, but it happened very far away. I was traveling in India. The reason I was in India is because I was the chairman of an organization called Opportunity International. Opportunity International is a micro-lending organization. I don't know how many of you are familiar with micro-lending, but it is the process of lending very small amounts of money to people who are exceedingly poor, living on less than $2 a day. And, through the, and they have no access to credit. And so they literally live hand to mouth. And micro-lending is the process of giving small amounts of money along with entrepreneurial training so that someone can learn how to build their own business. And so I was chairing a board meeting of the board of directors of Opportunity International. And at the end of this board meeting, it is a global organization, Opportunity International has lent about $10 billion about $100 at a time in places all over India and Africa and Asia and Latin America. And at the end of this board meeting, I decided that I wanted to meet with some of our clients. And so we traveled to the slums because our clients were poor and they lived in the slums of New Delhi, India. How many of you have ever been to India? Okay. So perhaps you know that the slums in New Delhi, like slums in many countries, are very desperate places. They were honestly some of the most desperate places I had ever been. And as we entered this uh, neighborhood, this community, I saw mountains of trash, I saw marauding animals, there was sewage in the streets, there were people piled on top of each other. It was a very desperate set of circumstances. And I had to, I didn't have to, I wanted to meet with our clients, 10 of them, and they had gathered on a rooftop. And I climbed a ladder to meet them on the rooftop. And as I was climbing up that ladder, honestly, I was stealing myself. Because I expected to see desperate people because their circumstances were desperate. But when I got to the top of the roof and I sat down with these 10 clients, they and they talked to me about the businesses they had built. One woman in particular stands out in my mind because she told me the story of how afraid she was to take the loan and the training that we were providing. She was afraid to take the loan because in her culture, in her family, women didn't do this. Despite the desperate poverty of her family, Despite the fact that this loan and this training could help lift her family from poverty, her husband said, no, women don't do this. Her parents said, no, these are not our expectations of you. Her in-laws said, no, that's not the way we do things. That's not unusual. Substitute the situation and the person, and loads of times people are told, despite the problem, despite how difficult it is, no, because we don't do things that way. No, because that isn't what we expect of you. No, because there is some other plan for you. And yet, after about a year, this woman found her courage and said, but I can make this situation better. The problem I'm dealing with is my family is in poverty. I can do something about this problem. I can't fix my whole neighborhood, but I can help fix my family. And so she took the loan. And I asked her, well, what does your family think now? And she said, oh, they're very happy. They all work for me. That story, I tell you that story, because that story is about how each of us find our way. 
It is a story about someone who, despite discouragement from everyone around her, it is a story about a person who said, no, this is my problem to solve. Despite everyone's expectations, despite what everyone says I should and shouldn't do, I can make a difference here. I tell you this story because this woman represents to me a pure example of leadership. Leadership. She had no title. She had no position. She is not famous. And yet, she is a leader. She is a leader because she unlocked her own potential. She focused it on a problem that was closest to her, that was hers to solve. And she lifted others up as well. And in the end, leadership is what all of us are meant for. When each of us find out that we can lead, we have found our way. When each of us realize that there are problems in front of all of us every single solitary day, and when we decide we're going to make a difference for the problems that we're meant to solve, that's when we unlock our own potential for leadership, for impact, to change the order of things for the better. And that's what we're here for, to change the order of things for the better. Now, there's a couple things that are worth noting about everything I just said. The first is, wow, that's leadership? You know, when people say the word leader, they don't think of a poor woman in India. And yet she was. She is. What do you think of when you hear the word leader? What do you think of? Yeah. I'm sorry? Either one. Captain America. Captain America, okay? There's a leader. I saw another hand up here. Tell me a leader you think you know. Yeah. Someone who tells other people what to do. Someone who tells other people what to do. All your professors. All your professors. Uh huh. Initiative. Leaders eat last, so they sacrifice for others. Yeah. Boss. Your boss. Yeah. My mother. Your mother. I think of someone confident. Someone confident. What? The president. The president. OK. Now, all, all those examples, not all of them, a lot of those examples have to do with someone who has a title. Captain America has a title. The president has a title. Your boss has a title. Someone who tells somebody else what to do probably has a title, right? A lot of times when we think about the term leader, we think about people with titles, positions, power to tell other people what to do. Maybe we think about someone who's famous. Captain America is famous. The president is famous. I was recently on YouTube. This one really threw me, I have to tell you. I know you and I are a different generation, but I didn't, do you know what mukbanging is? OK, yes, all right, so there you go. Some of you know what, I didn't until last week. Mukbanging is eating a lot of food really fast and doing it on video so other people will watch. And apparently we have a new mukbang leader on YouTube who makes a million dollars a year eating shellfish really fast in a sloppy and disgusting way. And people pay to watch that. She was called a leader. So often we think of leaders as people who are famous, who have titles, who have positions, who have power. And I am here to tell you that some of those people may indeed be leaders. Captain America may be a leader, but not because his name is Captain America. Your mother is a leader 
not because she's your mom. Each of us find our own way when we learn that we are made to lead. Not born to lead, made to lead. And we understand that, we realize that when we realize what leadership is actually about. Leadership is not about position or title or power, although sometimes leaders have those things. Your boss may or may not be a leader. I've had a lot of bosses who were not leaders, although they did tell me what to do. You might have a boss who's a manager. Managers are people who do the best they can with whatever the circumstances are. Leaders change the circumstances. The reason I told you the story about the woman in India is because she was a leader. Why was she a leader? Not because she had position or title and she actually had no power in her culture. She was a leader because she decided to change the order of things for the better. She decided to tackle the problem that was right in front of her, which was, my family is desperately poor. She decided to take advantage of an opportunity that she never would have seen had her head been down the whole time. She picked her head up, she stopped, she looked, she listened, and all of a sudden she saw this opportunity out there called, let me get a loan and learn how to become an entrepreneur. And so she did that. And she changed the order of things for the better. Leaders are made, not born. Don't let anyone say to you, well, you're a born leader. No, you're gonna discover your leadership capacity or not. And there are a lot of people in life, all of us have the potential to lead, but so many of us choose not to because leadership is hard. So we're gonna talk about what makes a leader because it is my fond hope for all of you that this week and for the rest of your lives, you search for the potential inside you which you have, and you choose to become a leader because you focus your energies on changing the order of things for the better by solving the problems that you are meant to solve. And my promise to you, based on my own life and so many others I have observed, my promise to you is if you will do those things, if you will focus on your own potential to lead, if you will focus your potential on changing the order of things for the better, on solving the problem that is yours to solve, that you will go far, even if you ditch the plan, and even if you disappoint people by doing something other than what they thought you should do. You'll find out what you're made of, and you'll have a big impact. So let's talk about what's the essence of leadership if that woman is a leader. Let's unpack it a little bit. So here you are, you're this woman, or you're Captain America. We could use the Captain America example. What's the first thing that Captain America has to have or that woman in India had to have? Courage. Courage. That's exactly right. It's so obvious, right? You have to be brave. You have to have the courage to try something new. You have to have the courage to disappoint someone. That woman disappointed her family greatly until it worked. You have to have the courage to go against your tribe. You have to have the courage to get criticized. Oh my gosh, you're doing that? Courage is the first and most important ingredient for anyone who wants to unlock their own potential and become a leader and have an impact. You have to be brave. And there are so many signals that tell you to keep your head down and just stay where you're supposed to be. And those signals come from all kinds of people, a lot of people who tell you they're your friends. Anytime you try and make something better, anytime you actually try and solve a problem, I don't care what the problem is, what happens? What happens? You get criticized. What were you going to say? I'm sorry? 
Yeah, the possibility of failure. Wow, sometimes it's easier not to try, right? If you don't try, you can't screw it up. If you do try, you might screw it up. And even when you try before it's obvious whether you're going to succeed or fail, people are telling you, why are you doing this? See, there's a reason why problems hang around. It's not because people don't know what they are. It's because it's easier, safer to leave it alone. That's why. That's human nature. It doesn't mean people are bad. It's just easier and safer to leave it alone. And so a lot of times people do. And so if somebody says, I'm actually going to take the loan, I'm actually going to go against my family, what's going to happen? They're not going to get a lot of good for you, not at first. They're going to get a lot of what are you doing? And so courage is required. The criticism that you all endure on your phones is amazing. I mean, this device, I come from the world of technology. I was the CEO of Hewlett Packard. I love technology, but I also understand that technology is a very powerful tool for good or for ill. And one of the things that technology does is inundate people with pressure and criticism and messages to conform, to fit in, to go along. And all of those things you have to be willing to set aside sometimes to solve a problem that's in front of you. Now, I want to quickly say when I say the courage to tackle a problem, the courage to actually challenge the status quo and make something better, which unlocks our own potential and helps others as well, I keep using the term, what's your problem to solve? Because it is easy to be an armchair problem solver. An armchair pro problem solver. Let me tell you the story of a little boy named Austin Perrine. He's four years old. His dad decided one day that he wanted to take him and see how some people in their community lived, some people who were homeless. And so Austin Perrine and his dad took a walk in their city. And Austin at four said, can't we feed some of them? And so Austin decided that he was going to take his allowance and he was going to buy hamburgers at the local Burger King and hand them out. And so his dad helped him do that, and that's what Austin did. That's what Austin still does. Austin's gonna come on my podcast in a couple weeks. I'm very excited to talk to Austin. Now, aside from the fact that Austin is four, that's amazing, the reason that I tell you this story is because Austin didn't say, I want to solve world hunger. Austin didn't put on a t-shirt, end hunger now. Austin did something. Maybe you would say it was small, but the people who got the hamburger probably didn't. Austin was solving the problem that was in front of him that he could have an impact on. He can't solve world hunger, but he can take his allowance and buy a hamburger and give it to a homeless person. If you look up the term slacktivism in the dictionary, it is in the dictionary. Slacktivism is armchair problem solving. Slacktivism is when we say, you know what, I think this is a big problem, so I'm going to tweet about it. I think this is a big problem, so I'm going to post a photo about it. I think this is a big problem, so I'm going to wear a t-shirt. I think this is a big problem, so I'm going to go join a demonstration. It's not that there's anything wrong with those things but none of those things alone actually solve a problem. And sometimes we spend so much time talking about these way big abstract problems up here that we don't do anything about the problems right in front of us. If you care about hunger, don't think about world hunger, think about hungry people in front of you. If you care about social justice, a good thing to care about. Don't get it way up here, get it right down where you can do something about it. 
The world actually doesn't change because people talk about big ideas. The world changes because people do something right in front of them. That's how it always changes. But when you do something right in front of you, you're going to get criticized. And that's why you need courage. It's interesting, one of the things I've also learned in my life is that everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid. Afraid of all kinds of things. There are really profound fears like Captain America faces. I'm going to be killed by this enemy. Those are profound fears. A warrior goes into battle. I might die. My buddies might die. Those are profound fears. When I was diagnosed with cancer, that's a profound fear. I am going to die. When I realized our younger daughter was an addict, that's a profound fear. She is going to die. But the truth is, most of us also are paralyzed by fears that aren't very profound. I'm going to look foolish. My friends will criticize me. I'm going to fall out of my pack. I'm not going to fit in. I'm not going to measure up. I'm going to disappoint somebody. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to look like an idiot. Those fears, and we all have them, those fears can paralyze us. They can paralyze us, every single one of us. I have had so many times in my life where I felt like a fool. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm not going to fit in. I look stupid. And if we let those foolish fears stop us, we don't unlock our own potential, we don't change the order of things for the better, and we definitely don't lead. Some of the work that we do is with an organization called the Wounded Warrior Project. These are warriors who have been wounded grievously in battle. And so they have many physical issues, sometimes emotional issues as well. And I was with a group of employers who were putting on job fairs for them. And they were so excited because these employers wanted to hire 100 wounded warriors and only 10 or 15 would show up. And they were disappointed. Why were so few of these wounded warriors showing up? And finally, one of them said, because we're afraid. You don't imagine a warrior being afraid. Well, what are you afraid of? We're afraid we'll go and no one will offer us a job. So it's easier not to go. We're afraid we'll go and someone will offer us a job and we won't know how to do the job and we'll fail. So it's easier not to go. We're afraid that people will pity us instead of valuing us. So it's easier not to go. If you want to be Captain America, if you want to be a leader, if you want to unlock potential, if you want to solve the problem that's yours to solve, you have to figure out what you're afraid of. And we're all afraid all the time. And then you have to practice getting over it. So think about that. And we'll have an opportunity as the week goes on to talk more about courage. But it is the first and most important quality. The next and most important quality, if you actually want to lead, not in title, not in position, not in power, but by changing the order of things for the better and solving the problem that is yours to solve, and as you do so, unlocking your own potential, the next quality you must have, and Captain America has this too, is character. Character. And character is kind of an old-fashioned word. We don't really lift character up anymore. We tend to lift up in social media or on television. What do we lift up? We lift up controversy, outrage, conflict. That's who we watch, muckbanging. Wow, that's not character. But what do you think character is? Yeah. Being noble. Being, being noble. Doing the right thing when nobody's watching. 
doing the right thing when no one's watching. Both those things are right. It's honesty over time, every time, whether someone knows it or not. It's integrity over time, every time. It's consistency. It's generosity over time. The thing is, character is actually kind of important because you already know this, but you'll learn this over and over and over in your life. Things don't go quite the way you think they're going to go. It's never as easy as you think it's going to be. The going always gets tough. Something unexpected happens. And when all those things happen, it takes character to keep going. Character not to get thrown off course. Character not to kind of chicken out, take the easy way out, and kind of <coughs> go the way some of your friends might be going, even though you know it's the wrong thing to do. It takes character. And that is critical for leadership as well. Because the going always gets tough, particularly when you're trying to solve a problem that's right in front of you that's yours to solve, and that has sat there and festered for a long time, because it's easier just to leave it alone. That woman in India, until her family started working for her and she had to be pretty successful to employ four people, how much criticism do you think she got and how many times did she sit at home by herself thinking, oh my gosh, this is so much harder than I thought it would gonna be. It's not easy, it's not going quite the way I thought. Nothing ever goes the way you think, that's life. Things always go wrong, that's life too. And so it takes character to keep going. But I will also promise you that when things go wrong, when bad things happen, and they always do, they're part of life, if you can see it, if you can keep going, there are always blessings. Yeah? How do you know when to quit? How do you know when to quit? Maybe quitting is the wrong word. Maybe you need to change your approach. The question I think to ask is, is your goal something you really believe in? Is the problem you're trying to solve really something you think needs solved? So do you just quit when it gets hard? Maybe what you need is to change your approach and maybe also what you need is some help which leads us to our next important quality, collaboration. Nothing gets better with somebody acting alone. So when you're about ready to quit, find someone to collaborate with. Even Captain America has collaborators. He has allies. Sometimes school, at least when I was coming up in school, I was a great individual contributor. I was always the straight A student. And maybe you're the kind of person who says, yeah, I know I'm supposed to do teamwork with a team. You're going to have an opportunity to work with a team in your shark tank exercise later on. But maybe you think, yeah, but gosh, sometimes it's just so much easier to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself and it's going to be better. I don't want to deal with these other people. Let me warn you. Nothing truly worth doing ever happens with someone acting alone. Nothing. No matter what you're trying to do, if you're trying to do it all by yourself, you're not going to get as far and you're not going to achieve as much and it may not be worth doing in the end. So you'll need to learn how to collaborate with other people. You'll learn that this week, as I say, in your shark tank exercise. But collaboration is important because when you're about ready to quit, when you can't figure out the answer to a problem, when you need strength or help or a new idea from somebody, you better have someone on your team who you can collaborate with. Now, a lot of times people will say, boss, some one of you said he's the boss, he's the person who tells them what to do. A lot of times when I say collaborate, people think, well, yeah, so my goal here, I want to be the leader, I want to be the boss, I'm going to gather a group of people around me and I'm going to tell them what to do. Won't work. I mean, you'll get certain things done, but you're not actually going to change the order of things for the better and you're certainly not going to know what you're made of and you're not going to help anyone else get better either. 
Sometimes a leader has to tell other people what to do, but it's better actually, more effective, even if you have a huge position and title, and I've had huge positions and titles, it's actually better to actually collaborate with other people. And to do that, you have to have humility. Humility. And we don't celebrate humility a lot either. We celebrate ego, bravado, I'm great. Humility isn't false modesty. It's not the same as saying, oh my gosh, I can't do anything. That's not humility. Humility is Knowing who you are, knowing what your strengths are, having confidence, yes. But humility is knowing that you don't know everything. Humility is knowing you can't do it all alone. Humility is having the, making the decision to ask questions of others. Most of my early career, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I really didn't. I land in this technology company. I start as a secretary. I'm a medieval history and philosophy graduate. I dropped out of law school. I taught Italy. I taught English in Italy. I am not qualified. So I asked loads of questions all the time. What do you do? Tell me about your job. Are there problems you see? How can I be helpful to you? I ask questions. Asking questions is one of the most valuable and important things you can do in life. And unless you're humble, you won't ever ask, because you'll think you know it all. Or you don't need to know whatever they know, and yet you do. If you're going to solve a problem, if you're going to lead, you have to be humble enough to ask, humble enough to know, I need help, I don't know it all. The truth is, somebody mentioned President Trump, I'm not making a political statement in any way, but anyone who says, I alone can fix it, is wrong. I alone can never fix it. Everybody needs people to collaborate with. So you have to be humble enough. Now, when you ask a question, tell me about yourself. Tell me about why you think that's the right thing to do, and you actually want to know the answer. That's called empathy. Empathy. When you actually can hear what somebody else has to offer. When you actually can see someone else. Again, it's not false modesty, but it is to say, you know what, I have my experiences, I have my issues, I have my grievances, I have my problems, and by the way, you have yours. And I'm really interested in what yours are, because whatever your experiences and problems are, they bring something to the table. And when you're trying to solve a problem that's yours to solve, that's right in front of you, you don't have all the answers. You can't possibly, none of us know it all but somebody else maybe does. They have a different perspective. <coughs> so there's one last quality that leaders always have. People who find their way always have this quality. We talked about courage, we talked about character, we talked about humility and empathy and the ability to collaborate with others. The woman in India had all those things. What else did she have? What was one more thing she had? Focus, Focus yes. Yeah. Uh, foresight. Ah, foresight. Drive. Drive. Drive, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, something, to something. something to overcome. Something to overcome, yes. All those things are true. Resilience. Resilience. Faith, determination. determination, yeah. Competence. Competence, not at first, but she built it. Patience, Patience. all those are right. Selflessness. Selflessness. Selflessness, all those things are right. Uh, I'm sorry? She found her purpose. She found her purpose by focusing on a problem, right? Yes, all those things are right. And there's one other thing. She could see possibilities 
where no one else could. She saw the possibility that her family could be lifted out of poverty. No one else saw that. It's why they were willing to say, no, 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 we can't do this. Leaders see possibilities. In my experience, there are two kinds of people, and maybe you've met these two kinds of people. Like if you have a project at school, or you have a big game coming up, or whatever it is, there, there are people who will stand over here, and they'll start by saying, okay, look, we, we can't do this. They won't let us do that. We already tried the other thing. Oh well, my gosh, we're up against the number one team. We're never gonna win. There are people who start talking about the barriers, the constraints, the hurdles. They spend a lot of time talking about the barriers and the constraints and the hurdles. And then there are other people who will come to exactly the same set of circumstances and they will say things like, but we could, and no one's told us we can't do this, and we've never tried that. Captain America, among other things, sees possibilities in his fellow human being. You don't need superpowers like Captain America to lead or to be a problem solver, but you do have to have the imagination to see that things can be better. Or call it optimism. If you don't believe things can be better, they'll never be better. So one of the things I like to say, if you're going to solve a problem, we'll talk more about it later this week, if you're going to solve a problem, you have to be clear-eyed and realistic about what the problem is. You can't kid yourself. You can't pretend that something is different than it is. But that clear-eyed realism about, gee, there are homeless people who are hungry right in my block, that clear-eyed realism has to be balanced with optimism. A belief that things can get better if we will apply energy and potential and leadership to make them better. Because unless you think things can get better, they never will get better. Okay. You find your own potential. You unlock your own potential. You find your way in life, all of us do, by picking up our head, having the courage to get off the rut, whatever rut you think someone wants you on, or maybe you feel like you're on. Picking up your head, looking around, listening, finding the problem that's yours to solve. Because leaders are made by solving problems, and each of us are born to lead, actually. In the end, we need to be courageous and brave. We need to have character and determination and focus, all these things you've talked about. We need to be humble enough and empathetic enough to collaborate with others, and we have to see possibilities. And if we find all of those things within us, and we all have them, then we are on a path that can take us further than we realize and that can sustain us through life. And those things are the essence of leadership. Questions? Yes? Finding your own path like, opens opportunity for a lot of failure. Yep. What would be your advice for dealing with failure and not letting it discourage you? So finding your own path can open yourself up to lots of failure. What is your advice for dealing with failure? It's true. First, let's examine the word failure. It's such a heavy word, right? Failure. It sounds fatal. It's not. Winston Churchill once said, it's one of my favorite quotes of Winston Churchill, he once said, uh, success is never final and failure is never fatal. And that's true. You know, people who are on top of the pile, 
don't always stay there. You're too young for this, but someday you're gonna go to a high school reunion. And you'll be surprised how many of the people you knew in high school who seemed destined for inevitable and endless success aren't. And the people that you thought, oh, what a screw up, suddenly are a success. So failure isn't fatal. But I would prefer to use the word mistake because the thing is, what does failure mean? I didn't achieve my goal, right? I didn't achieve my goal. Or I made a mistake. The key is not to make the same mistake twice, to learn from a mistake. And when you fail to achieve a goal, to sit down and think about why. Not to beat yourself up, but to learn. Here's the thing. If we are afraid of failure, afraid of making mistakes, and lots of people are, we will never try anything new. It's why you see so many people as they get older in life stop taking risks. Because they're afraid to fail. They're afraid to make a mistake. And when people stop taking risks, when people stop trying something new, honestly, they get old before their time. And they don't achieve what they could. So you have to learn that failure isn't fatal. You have to learn that, what do I learn from this failure? Why didn't I achieve my goal? Maybe I didn't collaborate with the right people. Maybe I set the goal too far away from me. Maybe I tackled the wrong problem. Maybe I've learned something about myself. Every time you confront a mistake or a failure and you can be thoughtful and introspective about it, you get better and stronger, truly. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, throughout your speech, you spoke about like, the importance of collaborating with people. Have you ever had a moment where one of your coworkers or people on your team uh, wasn't holding up their end of the board, for lack of a better term, and how did you deal with that? Absolutely, so when you're collaborating with other people, have you ever had someone who didn't hold up their end of the bargain? Yeah, that's, it happens so often, right? Have you ever heard the old 2080 rule? 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Sometimes that's true. And it's one of the reasons why sometimes we all say, oh gosh, it's just easier if I do it myself because so-and-so won't hold up their end of the bargain. So if you actually care about, sometimes, honestly, it's easier to just move on. But the truth is, if you actually want to achieve a goal that requires all those people's help, then you're gonna have to have an honest conversation. And boy, are those hard. And they take a lot of courage. And sometimes when you have an honest conversation, it can feel like a failure because you feel like you haven't gotten anywhere. But what I mean by an honest conversation is to actually have the respect for the other person to sit down and say to them what is true. You know, we really are counting on you in this project, and you're not holding up your end of the bargain. You're not delivering what you said you would. You're not being accountable. I need you to step up. Those are hard conversations to have. And I can tell you that in organizations all over this country, people avoid those conversations. We avoid having an honest conversation. It feels so scary and so risky. And yet, without an honest conversation, what happens? It just drifts along not very, in not very satisfying a way. And so if you want to lead, if you want to collaborate, if you want to solve the problems you're meant to solve, you have to learn how to have an honest conversation with respect, with care for the other person. You're not judging them. You're not condemning them. But you are telling them the truth. You're not holding up your end of the bargain. Why? We need you. Here's an interesting thing about leaders. To be a leader, you have to find and unlock your own potential, but it's also true that e leaders unlock potential in others. 
Those two men who came to my desk so long ago and said, you have possibilities, they unlock potential in me. I think it is a leader's highest call, <coughs> is to unlock potential in others. And so when you're afraid of that honest conversation, just remember this, you may be helping that person unlock their potential because you've actually told them. We need you to step up. It's one of the reasons why I am not a fan of participation trophies, honestly. Not everybody's good at baseball. Live with it. Find what you are good at. And sometimes you've got to have that kind of conversation. Yeah? So one of our main goals this week is entrepreneurship. Uh-huh. OK, so entrepreneurship. That's right, one of your goals. And by the way, there's a reason. Let's just talk for a moment about the reason that entrepreneurship and leadership always go together. What are entrepreneurs doing? They're creating something new, right? You're creating something new. An entrepreneur creates something new. And you're creating something new because you see a need that is unmet or a problem that needs solved, right? And that, in a way, is the essence of leadership that we've been talking about. An entrepreneur is not a manager. A manager is doing the best they can with the way things are. Doesn't make managers bad people, but they're not entrepreneurs and they're not leaders. So, as you're focusing on being an entrepreneur, think about what is an unmet need? What is a problem that needs to be solved? Who do I need around me as my collaborators, as my team, to help me achieve this goal? People tend to think of an entrepreneur as a lone entrepreneur all by themselves. They never are. Not if they're going to succeed. they got to have help. So look for unmet needs and unsolved problems, and then think about who can help you meet those needs and solve those problems. Yes? I have hand out sandwiches to homeless people in the group, and there are people who tell me that um, they'd rather find out why people are homeless in the first place instead of doing those small things. What would you say to them? Well, I think both things are true. But I think if we want to have an impact, we have to start with what's right in front of us. So for example, if, I'm not sure everyone could hear him. You help hand out food to the homeless people. That's wonderful. Good for you. And some people criticize him and say, well, I really want to find out why people are homeless in the first place. Now, one of two things is going on. Either that person who's telling you, I want to find out why people are homeless in the first place actually isn't doing anything, and that's their way of criticizing you. Okay, that happens. Sometimes criticism is veiled. Well, you know, why are you wasting your time on that? I want to find out why people are homeless in the first place. Does that sound a little bit like slacktivism? Yeah, yeah that's exactly what it sounds Let me wear the t-shirt. Why are... Now, another interpretation might be that somebody actually is ish interested in issues of mental health. And that's where they're going to go spend their time. That's good. Or maybe someone is interested in what happens when cities like Washington, D.C. so rapidly gentrify that people who've lived in neighborhoods for generations suddenly can't afford housing. And what should we do about that? OK, those are other aspects of the problem that they also perhaps could get engaged in. So you have to understand why they're saying that. But meanwhile, you keep handing out food, because you're making a difference. Yes? Uh, what's your advice on the people who are criticizing you just because like, they don't like you or they do like you? Like, it's not like they see a problem in what you're doing just because they want to. Yeah, they just don't like you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. They, yeah. OK, so one of the things it's important to learn, and it took me a long time to learn this, OK? I was one of those, I, I told you, I was a people pleaser. People criticizing me was devastating. You know, I wanted to be. Perfect. By the way, that's impossible. So perfection is never the goal. What do you do? It's important to learn the difference between criticism and feedback. OK, what's criticism? Criticism comes from people who don't care about you. They don't care about you. They don't like you. Maybe they're just trying to make themselves feel better. Wow, this guy's handing out food at homeless. I'm doing nothing. But guess what? You know, that doesn't help. You need to be focused on the bigger issues. Whatever that, what do they criticize you over? Uh, I don't know. Just, yeah, okay. So 
you're gonna, ha you're gonna encounter two kinds of people in your life, on your phone or face to face. Two kinds of people. First kind of person is someone who tears you down. They're tearing you down on your phone, they're tearing you down face to face, and there's another kind of person who lifts you up. People who are criticizing you are tearing you down. That's their motive. Some people, too many people, don't feel good about themselves unless they make you feel worse. That's how they make themselves feel better. You have many choices in life. One of the most important choices you make is how you spend your time. Don't spend your time with people who tear you down. Don't spend your time on your phone with people who tear you down. Don't spend your time face to face with people who tear you down. Because there are loads of other people who lift you up. And the people who lift you up give you feedback. Feedback might hurt sometimes. Feedback might be, you know what? You are an awesome guy and you have so much potential, but you really suck at baseball. And so you need to find another outlet as one silly example. Feedback is critically important because feedback helps us all get better, but feedback is delivered to us by someone who cares about us. You're really not holding up your end of the bargain here in our group, and I want you to do better. So tell me what's going on with you. That's feedback. The people who criticize you are tearing you down. Ignore it. I learned this. Look, I've been in the press a lot in my life, and a lot of that press has been very critical press because I was first and different and controversial because leaders who do things are controversial too. And it used to just eat me up. And then one day I was meeting with Oprah Winfrey, believe it or not, and she was going through a really bad period of press. And I said, Oprah, how do you deal with it? And she said, I ignore it. Best advice I ever got, I ignore it. If someone's criticizing you and tearing you down, ignore it. If someone's caring about you, lifting you up and giving you feedback, listen, they're trying to make you better. Yes. And then I'll come over here. There was Anna. Yes. For leadership in business and elsewhere. So the question was in, you know, what characteristic? And honestly, it's all of them. That, that's why I talk about them as a group. Because um, courage without character is a lot of misdirected behavior. You can be really brave <laughs> and do a bunch of things that really aren't what you ought to be doing. You can be brave and have character, but if you don't have humility and empathy as well, then you're gonna be a bull in a china shop and be moving things around but not helping anything. If you can't see possibilities, then you'll miss the unmet need or the unsolved problem. And so honestly, I think it's a package deal. You have to have courage. You have to have the character to keep going. You have to be humble enough and empathetic enough to collaborate with others, and you have to see possibilities wherever you go. It's all of them. So the question is drive and, and uh, has helped is chance and luck. Depends how you define chance and luck, but yes, in this sense. Um, for most of my career, I took the jobs nobody wanted. Frequently that was because those were the only jobs available to me. But my point is, what I learned about myself is if there's a really bad problem and nobody wants this job, that's gonna be interesting, challenging. You can call it luck, you can call it chance, you can call it taking advantage of an opportunity. Certainly people have helped me. People have lifted me up. 
But yes, sometimes chance will put something in front of you and the question is, do you see it? Do you see it? Sometimes luck will put an opportunity in front of you and the question is, will you go after it? Or will you walk away? Life, chance, luck. Life puts lots of things in front of us. And what life is made of is what you choose to pursue. Or if you choose to walk away. Yes? So the question is, what's the difference between being a leader in business and being a leader in politics? Well, I think leadership is, leadership is always the same, no matter where you are. It's always the same things, honestly. It takes the same qualities. It takes a focus on other people, those you serve, instead of yourself. And it takes a focus on changing the order of things for the better and solving a problem. So that's true in a university setting, in a political setting, in a business setting, in a church setting. It's just the thing is that there are some settings that aren't very conducive to leadership. And one of the things that I think has happened to our politics is it's not about leadership anymore, it's about winning. It's about winning. It's not a partisan comment. Politics has become about running and winning, running and winning, running and winning. That's not the same as problem solving. Because the thing is, the dynamic of winning, think about a sports analogy, or you could use a political analogy. The dynamic of winning is what? I win, you lose. That's not the dynamic of problem solving. The dynamic of problem solving is win, win, always, always. And so the question is not, is leadership different in politics or in business? The question is, is leadership lifted up in a particular setting? There are a lot of businesses where leadership isn't valued. Management is valued. Just keep things the way they are, everything's going good. And in politics right now, I think what's lifted up is winning, not problem solving. Yeah? I've heard a leader is a dealer of hope. What are your thoughts on that? A leader is a dealer in hope. I agree with that, but it's not enough. So I would say a leader is a dealer in hope because they see possibilities and they put those possibilities in front of people and say these are possibilities. However, if all a leader does is inspire and does not catalyze actual progress towards the goal, then eventually hope turns into cynicism because nothing changes. So you can't just deal in vision and hope, you actually gotta do the hard work as a leader to make progress towards the goal. What if the woman in India had stood up and said, hey, we're gonna be rich, I'm gonna start a business. And she dealt in hope, but then she didn't follow through. Her family would have been still poor and more cynical. Sometimes politicians are dealers in hope, but they don't make progress. I led a $90 billion company. How did you deal with that pressure? Mm. So when I first became the chief executive of Hewlett Packard, we were 40 billion, and by the time I left, we were 90 billion. And yes, it was a lot of pressure. So honestly, I used the same techniques that I'm talking to you about here. I did not listen to criticism. When it was just people yak, 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 I didn't listen because it gets in your head and it gets in your heart. When the going got tough, I would reach out to the people that I knew shared my goals and objectives. Perhaps they were on my team, perhaps they were in my family, perhaps they were partners in business, perhaps they were competitors who understood some of the pressure. I reached out to get help from others. I understood, analyzed, understood the situation very well. I never winged it, never. So if you are prepared in a pressure-filled situation and you are supported in a pressure-filled situation and you 
are thoughtful and deliberate and intentional and careful about every decision you make, then you're not going to be perfect, but you're going to be perfect enough. Yeah, how I got there was what I've been talking about, literally. Um, yes, I can. And how I got there was solving the problems in front of me. So I will answer your question, but I'm being very uh, truthful. It's why I've been talking to you about it. When I started at the very bottom of the totem pole, no one saw me as a CEO, including myself. I solved problems, and people noticed. And then I got a little promotion, and I solved more problems, and people noticed. And then I got another promotion, and I solved problems, and people noticed. There is, you'll hear, I'm sure, teachers and parents and others have said to you, there is no substitute for hard work. That's true. There is no substitute for results. Produce results. Make a difference. Change the order of things for the better. It'll do you more good than anything else. And because I wasn't afraid to take a risk, because I wasn't afraid of failure, even though I could, I took lots of different jobs. So I went into engineering when I knew nothing about engineering. I went into manufacturing when I knew nothing about manufacturing. I went into finance when I knew nothing about finance. So I solved problems, I produced results, and I had a broad experience, not a narrow experience. And every time I went into a job where I knew nothing, I wasn't arrogant. I didn't run in and say, hey, I'm the boss. I'm going to tell you what to do. Instead, I was humble and I asked. I asked lots and lots and lots of questions, and I learned as much as I could about everything going on around me, from the people around me who sometimes knew more than I did. And all that breadth of experience and the production of results over time and solving problems and learning every single day prepared me when I was offered that job. And by the way, when I was offered that job, a ton of people said, don't take that job. It's a big problem. It's a loads of problems. Don't take that job. You'll fail. By the way, it was loads of problems. All those things mattered. There is no one plan to get to the top. That's also what I'm trying to convey. You'll, you'll have people who will say to you, there's a, you know, you got to get on a plan. And this is how you go from the bottom to the top. These are the specific jobs you're supposed to take. I'm here to tell you, wrong. Wrong. Look at the opportunities right in front of you, the opportunities to make a difference, the opportunities to produce results, the opportunities to learn something. Those are going to serve you better. Yes? Yep. So, uh, and this will be the last question. Um, you talked about challenging yourself, but challenging yourself can be really difficult and it can get really discouraging. Yes, it can. Because the thing is, when you tackle something hard, it doesn't work out right away sometimes. The reason people tell you don't take the hard jobs, and they will, don't take the hard jobs, take this one, this one, th you can succeed in this one. You'll hear that all the time in your career. It'll come faster, it'll come easier, that's true. So it's hard to say, no, I want to take the job where there are a lot of problems, because then I can make a big difference with people around me. It goes back to what I said before. First of all, you have to learn that taking on challenges, solving problems, it may feel hard at first, and it is, but it gets easier with practice, just like everything does. Courage gets easier with practice. But it's also true that the more challenging assignments you take on, the better you get. So you don't start with the $40 billion company. You start with a little problem right in front of you, and you build those muscles. It's like when you work out, or you learn a sport, or you learn how to read. All those things you start out small. And then you tackle a little more, and it gets a little easier. And you tackle a little more, and it gets a little easier. It takes practice. 
It takes practice. So the first time you fall down and get discouraged, don't quit. Try again. It also takes collaboration. The reason I said to you look for people who will lift you up is because when you get discouraged, you need those people to lift you up. You need the people who actually care about you and want you to be as good as you are, to come around you and say, come on, look how far you went. Okay, maybe you didn't get to the 100-yard line, but you made it to the 80-yard line. Here's the thing. You know this intuitively, maybe, but let me assure you that this is how life works out. There are people who will set the bar really low so that it's easy to walk over and they can say, I won. And then there are people who learn to set the bar a little higher. And even when they fail to clear that bar, they got a lot further than if they'd set the bar way down here. That's just true. And it's true in life as well. So don't spend your time this week or this year, don't spend your time setting a low bar so you can walk over it and declare victory and post your photo on Instagram. Set the bar a little higher so that you figure out how much more you have inside than you thought. And when you fall short the first time, seek support from the people who are there to lift you up and try again. And just like anything else, reading, riding a bike, learning a sport, the more you do it, the more you want to do it. The more you want to do it, the more you can do it. The more you can do it, the more you will do it. Thank you all. Have a great day today.